there. This is Phoebe from The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Are you into cosplay, corsetry, steampunk gothic, or rockabilly clothing? Do you like shoes and accessories that are way cool? Then you must visit Subculture Corsets and Clothing, either online at www.subculturecorsets.com or drop by their store at the Avenues Mall in Jacksonville, Florida. Dave, we should have stopped in on our way to Florida last summer. I know. We screwed up. Oh, we should have planned better. Yes. I could have got a cute dress for the cruise. I know. Next time. Yeah. They're located just a half a mile off of I-95. They have an amazing selection of cool clothing, carry sizes 4 through 4X, and men's clothing as well. Tell them you heard about their ad on the Project Entertainment Network and the Horror Show with Brian Keene and receive a 10% discount off your entire purchase. Or when checking out their website, use the discount code The Horror Show with Brian Keene and receive a 10% discount on your entire order. I like discounts. Can you tell? So if you're looking for something different, unusual, and very, very cool, visit subculturecorsets.com or when traveling through Jacksonville, Florida, stop in and check out their store at the Avenues Mall. Tell them Phoebe sent you. I must go now. Time to shop. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network. I am your host, Brian Keene, flying solo this week. That's right. Uh, none of the co-hosts, Dave, Coop, Mary, Phoebe, Lombardo, or Dungeon Master 77.1 could join me here in studio today. That is because we are all digging out from Winter Storm Stella, the blizzard, not blizzard, that impacted parts of the East Coast this week. Uh, but have no fear, I am here, and apparently I'm rhyming. Um, this is what happens when I don't have somebody else here in the studio with me to play off of and feed off of. This week's show is brought to you by Brian Smith's Murder Squad, a wild epic of mayhem, murder, and destruction. In Murder Squad, a powerful secret organization brings together three notorious villains and tasks them with the mission of creating a nationwide panic by doing what they do best, killing lots of people, but on a bigger and bolder scale than ever before. The goal is distraction. The organization has things it wants to accomplish while the public isn't paying attention. Whether this goal can be achieved is uncertain, but one thing is definite. There will be blood. Lots and lots of blood. Murder Squad by Brian Smith is available right now in paperback and for Kindle on Amazon.com. Thanks to him for sponsoring this week's show. Um, coming up later in the broadcast, we have a fascinating interview with Ralph Bieber. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Ralph Bieber, um, he was a best-selling horror author, a uh, New York Times bestseller under the name H.R. Halland. He was a uh, part of a writing duo that went under that name. He also had some success under his own name. Um, he had it all. And then he walked away from writing and from this genre for a decade. Now he's back, and we're going to talk about, first of all, why he left and why he's come back and, and how things have changed in that time. Uh, but before we do all that, we're going to do the news. And I also uh, I want to start off by talking about Kong, Skull Island. Um, I'm going to apologize, folks. I was out shoveling snow before I decided to sit and record this week's podcast. So 
if I sound hoarse, if I sound stuffy, that's why I am, in fact, stuffy. <coughs> there's a, there's something you, you don't hear on this show very often, but Dave's not here to tell me to stop. So, anyway, Kong, Skull Island. Um, I took both my sons to see that last weekend. Uh, Dungeon Master 77.1 and his older brother. Um, now, I'm 49. And my oldest son is 26. And, of course, Dungeon Master 77.1 turns nine years old this week. Um, so that's three very different age groups. Um, all of us are fans of the King Kong franchise. Um, you know, we've seen the original 1933 King Kong. We've watched Son of Kong. Um, in fact, Dungeon Master 77.1 just watched Son of Kong for the first time this week, uh, during the blizzard, in fact, and he, he was very sad at the end. Um, I think that impacted him even more than the original King Kong, but yeah, both of those, of course, King Kong versus Godzilla, King Kong escapes, which is, you know, terrible, but it does have Mechana Kong, so, you know. It has that going for it. Uh, the 1976 King Kong remake, uh, which neither of the boys care for. And, you know, I have a, a nostalgic appreciation of it, but, you know, it's not my favorite either. Um, King Kong Lives, you know, where they, they give him the, uh, <laughs> the bionic heart. Um, Peter Jackson's King Kong remake in 2005. Um, now... All, all of us, all three of us, uh, me and both my sons, we, we all agree that the original 1933 King Kong is our favorite film in the franchise. Um, nothing has ever topped that. The remakes, I don't, they stand on their own merits or fail on their own merits, um, but neither of the remakes have ever truly captured the magic of the 1933 original. Um, the Japanese films, King Kong vs. Godzilla and King Kong Escapes, again, they are their own thing. Yeah, they're, you know, they're part of the franchise, but it, the the magic of the 1933 original isn't there. Um, Son of Kong sort of captures that, but not really. Uh, well, all of us went to see Kong Skull Island, and all three of us agreed um, it's it's the first King Kong movie in the franchise to actually capture the spirit and the magic of that 1933 original. All of us agreed, you know, we, we still like the original the best, but Skull Island is the second best film in this franchise. Um, it, uh, you know, it's only topped by the original. Um, so I, I can't tell you enough, if you're a fan of of the King Kong franchise, you, you need to see this on the big screen. Don't wait for Netflix or for On Demand. Go and see it in the theater. It is so much fun. So much fun. All three of us, we just had a ball. Um, there's a big final battle at the end, and, and I caught myself leaning forward, you know, to just absorbed into the action, and then I, I looked over and, uh, both Dungeon Master and his older brother were doing the same thing, and we had all done it independently of each other. It just, it just ropes you right in. It's a fantastic film, so much fun, and uh, yeah, I, I really urge you to see it on the big screen. I'm really glad I got to share that with both my boys. So this is the part where Dave would fill in while I take a drink. Dave's not here. If you're at home listening, feel free to drink along. No, I'm not drinking bourbon. Um, I'm recording this at 9.30 in the morning. I'm drinking aloe vera juice drink. Um, and I also have coffee. My coffee is, of course, brought to you by our friends at White Castle. Uh, the Crave is a powerful thing. Feed your Crave at any available White Castle. Uh, so I have those two things here with me. Let's start with some good news. Author Eric Williams, whose books include Demon, Guardian, Watcher, Bigfoot, Crank Stomp, and many more, uh, became a father again this week. He announced the birth of Fulton Anthony Williams on Twitter, um, and Fulton is a very cute baby. 
Um, so congrats to Eric and his wife and their three daughters on this new arrival. <laughs> now, I got to tell you, between four kids and his day job as a defense contractor, um, because I don't know if folks know that or not. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, uh, but I just did. Um, yeah, Eric, very much like Weston Oaks and uh, a couple other folks in, in our industry, um, he has a day job as a defense contractor. He can't really talk about what he does. Um, but yeah, between that and 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 four kids now, I, I, I don't know when he's going to find time to write. But, uh, you know, congratulations to you, Eric. That's, that's awesome news. Um, some other really good news. We had talked earlier in the year about Dread Central, uh, one of our favorite websites. They've always been very good to me. They've been very good to the show. We often return the favor. Um, we had talked about how they were having financial difficulties and how they had turned to Patron to keep the site afloat. Uh, well, now they have partnered with the Epic Pictures Group. Uh, Dread Central's owner, Steve Barton, wrote on the website, quote, It was back in early December when we revealed to the world that we here at Dread Central, like many other websites, were on the brink of extinction. With nowhere else to go short of folding, we turned to you guys, our readers and our life's blood. For the past several months, you've kept us going via Patron, and that is something we will never forget. Several months later, it became apparent we weren't going to make our goal of $6,000 per month. Um, that, that, is, that is the amount that they had needed for operating expenses. You know, uh, website updates, upkeep, uh, servers, paying their writers, very important, all that. Um, Barton continues, what you contributed combined with what we had left got us here to this point. Uh, but then the end was near and we knew we needed a miracle. The miracle came in the form of Epic Pictures Group, the company behind such incredible indie hits as Turbo Kid, Tales of Halloween, Big Ass Spider, and many more. Epic had a plan to partner up with us while keeping us autonomous and preserving the voice and integrity of the site that you've all come to love and rely on, uh, end quote. So, first of all, I, you know, awesome news, um, and kudos to Epic Pictures Group for, for stepping up and offering this. Um, you know, I think the important takeaway from that is uh, they have a plan to keep Dread Central autonomous, um, you know, which is important. Uh Barton goes on to to say uh, they're gonna you're gonna see some new faces uh, writing for Dread Central. Uh, Jonathan Barkin, who's already writing for them, and uh, probably the biggest part of this announcement, uh, Tony Timpone of Fangoria, uh, returning to the fold, and he is going to be writing for Dread Central as well. Uh, Barton goes on to say that he he will make another announcement, including uh, what's going to happen with the patron campaign in the coming weeks. So of course you want to keep an eye out for that. Um, so that's the good news for this week. Two, two bits of really good news. Uh, unfortunately now some bad news. Um, I'm very sad to report that Mike Roden passed away earlier, earlier this month. Uh, now many of you out there are probably saying who is Mike Roden? Well, Mike was the founder of the horrifying website and it's popular horrifying weekend convention. Uh, Mike operated mostly behind the scenes, but I can't stress this enough. He was absolutely crucial to bringing horror to the forefront of pop culture again in the early part of the 2000s. You know, that was the time when the genre was recovering from the mid-90s crash, uh, and Mike was a big part of that recovery. Um, he helped formulate and shape modern fan convention culture, and his contributions truly cannot be understated. Um, now, out of respect to his family, I'm not reporting any details of his passing, okay? I'm not going to say anything other than that he died earlier this month. Um, you know, once the family has had time to deal with this, I'm sure they'll release a statement and, you know, we'll, we'll of course report on that. Uh, but for the time being, I'm not going to report any of that. However, um, on next week's show, we are going to have an in-depth examination of horror find and its important place in our genre's history um that'll be me and dave and possibly mary and mike lombardo 
um, Mary San Giovanni and Mike Lombardo, um, you know, because they, all four of us, uh, have thoughts on horror find. Um, I hope you'll tune in for that. I think it's going to be a really good discussion. Um, as I said, it, it's an important part of our genre's history. One that doesn't get talked about a lot because I don't think a lot of folks really know about it. Um, you know, so we hope to honor Mike's memory in that way and hope you'll tune in for that. Um, see, Dave's not here to check the levels, so I'm, I'm checking the all the technical stuff, making sure everything's working here. <laughs> um, last week, listener Sean Small asked if uh, Wattpad was a good option for publishing. This was this was during our listener mailbag segment last week. Um, he wanted to know if Wattpad was a good option for publishing. And Dave and I didn't know because we're old and we weren't quite sure what Wattpad was. So I promised Sean that I would look into it and give him my thoughts. Um, so I did. Now, for you other old people out there, Wattpad is an online storytelling community. Basically, users post written works. They can post, you know, articles, essays, short stories, fan fiction, poems, things like that. Um, it's writers of all levels, uh, beginning writers, you know, kids, teenagers, adults. Um, and there are professional writers using the website as well. Um, and then what happens is, you know, you let's say you write a story. You post it on there. Uh, other Wattpad users are able to comment and like the stories, etc. Um, so I looked into it a little bit. Wattpad has ties with publishing houses to try to help Wattpad authors receive money for their works. Because it's important to note when you post something on Wattpad, you're not getting paid for it. Okay. Um, but as I said, they, they do have some ties with publishers to try to help some of their authors receive compensation. Um, in the past, they've teamed up with Sourcebooks. Um, Random House and Harper Collins have approached popular Wattpad authors to negotiate public publishing deals. Um, perhaps the most famous is uh, Anna Todd, whose work after has received over a billion reads on the website. Um, she got a deal through Simon and Schuster. Uh, to turn that multiple book published saga, you know, in, into multiple books. Um, and then Paramount picked up uh, the rights to it to, to make a, a movie. So, you know, Anna Todd is a big success story there. Um, and yeah, Random House, Harper Collins, you know, they've, they've got people watching the site. Uh, the key there seems to be popularity. You know, you're just, just like on social media, you, you, you've got to have a lot of likes a lot of customer reviews or user reviews for it to to get that notice. Um, there are some problems with Wattpad, however. Early in its history, uh, you know, there was a large volume of, of material being uploaded by users, and it turns out a lot of that was copyrighted material um, created by authors who did not grant republication rights. Um, basically, you know, people were uploading books and stories they didn't have the rights to, other people's books and stories. Um, now, Wattpad, they they released a statement about this. Um, you know, on, on their website, they note, we do not welcome upload of material that violate its copyright terms. Okay. But then they also state, it's simply not possible to screen and verify all posted content. Well, bullshit. Okay. If your website is based on that, then you better come up with a way to screen and verify all posted content. Okay. This is the, this is the standard trope that these fucking book piracy sites trot out time and time again. Oh, well, we, we can't police everything. Well, yeah, you can. There's software that can fucking do it. Okay. Um, Wattpad is making money. They've got all kinds of investors. They've had all kinds of venture capital. You know, I'm talking millions and millions of dollars. You can, you can spend a few thousand on the fucking software that will stop that. Um, now the New York times did a, a big article on this. Um, 
in which they said sites like Wattpad, which invite users to upload documents like college theses and self-published novels, have been the target of industry grumbling in recent weeks as illegal reproductions of popular titles have turned up on them. Um, you know, Wattpad has since then announced an Authors in Charge program, which is designed to allow authors or their representatives to identify and directly remove infringing content from the site. However, this program is designed specifically for authors with published books for sale. So if you're not an author with a published book for sale and, you know, let, let's say you post your story on Scribd and then somebody else steals it and posts it on Wattpad, um, you know, that, that doesn't count as a published book for sale. So there's a lot of gray area there. So, Sean, um, bottom line, is it a good option for publishing? I don't know. I, you know, first of all, you, you need to, you need to decide how you want your career to go. Um, there's no one path. There's no one road. Um, I would refer you back to the episode we did earlier this year, um, entitled give it away now where, uh, Dave and Lombardo and myself and special guest Stephen Kosinowski talked about the different paths to publication, whether you should be paid for your work, whether it's okay to give it away for free. Um, you know, listen to that and and decide, you know, where where you fall in that spectrum. Um, if you're okay giving your work away for free, then yeah, Wattpad is a, a good option for publishing. Um and as we've seen, you know, if your work is popular on Wattpad, it can lead to publication. Um, is it the path I would have chosen? Early in my career, sure. Um, but I would have I would have soon moved on. Um, you know, it, it's, it's probably a good proving ground for beginning writers. Um, but I don't know that it has much value beyond that. Uh, so that's just my two cents. That's my thoughts. But you asked, I answered. Um, okay, it, I guess it's going to be a short show this week because that's all I have. And I'm sitting here talking to myself. Uh, before we get to the interview with Ralph one more time, I want to thank this week's sponsor, uh, Murder Squad by Brian Smith, which is available right now in paperback and for Kindle on Amazon.com. All right, now we're going to go to the interview with Ralph. Um, once again, this was recorded during our live 24-hour telethon to benefit the Scares That Care charity. Um, it was not recorded here in the studio. It was recorded in a hotel conference room with a live audience. Um, so the sound quality is different, okay? If you can't hear the interview, turn your fucking speakers up. It's, it's that easy. E every week we get somebody, oh, oh, I can't hear the show. And then we respond with, did you, did you adjust the volume on your computer or your phone or your radio or however you're listening to this? And, oh, no, I didn't do that. Well, try that first. If you still can't hear the show, then let us know. Um, but anyway, yeah, let's go to the interview with Ralph, and then I'll catch you back here on the flip side. You got anything you want to talk about? Because if not, I got an idea. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> What's your idea? Well, I was going to test our interviewing skills. Now, when, when we do this show, I mean, we, you know, obviously interviews are a big part of the show. We've had on Jack Ketchum, Edward Lee, all these people. Um, what the listening audience at home doesn't know is that's not just off the cuff. We prep for like weeks in advance and, and, and we research and we craft our questions and we, we do a narrative. We never interview somebody without prepping first. But then Ralph Bieber goes and just shows up <laughs> here in person. Um, you can't have Ralph, Ralph in the, cloud, the crowd and not, not interview him. This but, is true. But we have no prepping, no homework done. Ah, so I was going to say, let's test ourselves. Um, let's just ask him like, really random questions that don't make sense. Well, see, that's, that's yeah. what I was going to do, yeah. but then you stepped on it. He's <laughs> <laughs> not prepared. Has he been drinking at all? He has not been drinking. Ralph, would you like a drink? Absolutely. Yeah, see, there you we go. Have, uh, we have a fine selection of bourbon for you. Oh, of course. <laughs> Alcohol gets applause. I like that. <laughs> All right. Come on down. Assume the position. Yes. Oh. 
We have Booker's, we have Knob Creek, we have Jim Knob Beam Creek. Rye. Knob Creek. Stop at Knob Creek. Rocks or no? Uh, no. Sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to point out Ralph is wearing a Faith No More shirt, which is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So we're not wearing that. So, I'm Brian's pouring you a Brian's drink. He's getting him alcohol. We have our own portable bar here. This is why you need to come visit. <laughs> now, Ralph, you're from uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania. Close enough. Close enough. Well, I didn't want to give your actual yeah out live on the air. Um, so if anybody out there is, is a fan of chocolate, now would be a good time to donate. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm tired, man. All right. Uh, uh, Ralph is perhaps best known as one half of the writing duo of H.R. Halland, yes. authors of The Epicure and Ashes. Yes. Um, his first solo collection, Sweet Nightmares, is on sale now. Um, he's also had fiction appear in In Layman's Terms and uh, several other anthologies. Yes. Welcome, surprise guest to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much. Glad to be here. <laughs> now, I, I had mentioned during Chuck Booty's interview, you have been doing this a long time. Um, pretty much as long as I have. You're one of the... Yeah, but I took a break. Well, you did. Um, but, yeah, let's, let's talk about like what got you into it in the first place. I mean, was this something you came to later in life, or did you always have oh, the bug? For writing? Yeah. Um, it came later in life. I've always had the horror bug. Yeah. Um, Saturday afternoons, I would spend watching Creature Double Feature, or, you know, the Hammer right. films. And um, that grew into starting to read Stephen King and Kuntz. Right. And, um... <clears throat> but you were, you were working a day job, never had any designs on writing? No. No desire? What, what kick-started it? Being downsized out of corporate America. So much Hi, like, Chuck. Much like Chuck <laughs> Lewis. Yeah? Yeah. Um... I left a uh, certain candy company okay. under not so good terms. Okay. And so maybe, uh, maybe listening audience, if you're not a fan of chocolate, <laughs> that would be a good time to donate. Donate. <laughs> um, I didn't really know how to vent the feelings that I was having at that point. Right. Um, but at that time, there was something popular called chat rooms, and um, I met Holly Newstein right. in a chat room, a Star Trek chat room of all things, and um, she told me that she had a short story that she was going to submit to Simon & Schuster, and um, she asked if I would read it. Not knowing that she lived right down the road in Reading. Right. Okay. Um, which was, I think it was fate. Yeah. Um, so she sends me the story. Now, were you wanting to be a writer? No. Before she sent you the story? Okay. No. No. All right. So she sends you the story. Right. I read it. I offer some feedback. She sends it in. Um, the story doesn't win, but when the manuscript comes back, it's really dog-eared. Right. It was read many times. Um, and at that point, I told her that I had an idea for a story that involved dispensing with some people that I wanted to have killed, right? honestly. Um, so you're writing what you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, yeah. Um, out of the light was that 
that venue. So your guy, your guys' first collaboration together, your first novel was Out of the Light. Yes. Um, so that was the, that stemmed from what you were going through at the time, and then Holly came on as a collaborator. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now um, that was very early on, and you guys yeah. self-published it. Now we talked a little bit about that during Chuck's interview, right. but talk about the stigma at the time that the two of you faced. We've stumped him, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I want to phrase this. Um, I don't know how I knew, but I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to pay anybody to be published. Right. Okay. Um, and we found Ex Libris, who at that point was print on demand, right? but we only bought the copies as we needed them. And of course we sold them out of the trunk. Right. So, um, so you guys would go to like book shows and wherever, craft fairs we, and we, sell books out of the trunk? We did very few signings. We did a couple Borders, Borders yeah. Express. Um, but honestly the book really didn't take off until you read it. Yeah. <laughs> that was what, 2000, 2001 maybe? It was 2001. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't really anybody at that point though. I mean, I had jobs oh, in no. hell, but it, it, that was pre the rising and all that. It was. But yet I could sell books, is that what you're saying? <laughs> you had... <laughs> well, jobs in hell had a pretty decent yeah. subscriber piece, Yeah, we did. did. We yeah. Did. Like, how many do you remember um, at its peak? Like, how many people subscribe to that? I genuinely don't remember. I want to say it was maybe 2,000 people. And okay. keep in mind, this was a, a 2,000-era email newsletter. Right. You know, there were like three of them. I had one. Doug Clegg had one. And I think someone else was doing one. I can't remember. We should explain to our, our younger listeners. There, there was no social media. There was barely a fucking internet. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there were like three websites devoted to horror. And, and as Ralph said, everything else was chat rooms. You didn't have Twitter or Facebook or right. any of that. But so when I when I mentioned it in Jobs in Hell, that's that's when you started to sell books. Uh, that's when the Stoker nomination came. Yeah. Um, and that's when I became involved with HWA, and we were officers in the Baltimore chapter together, yep. and. Boy, that's really going back. <laughs> it's like old school day old here. School. Um, <coughs> you know, but <clears throat> out of the light, people took notice to it. Right. Um, and I think it was because you saw it and the contacts that you had in the business at that time help promote you know because right. basically you did not self-publish back in those days no you were if you did you were considered well I remember right. when it when it got nominated for the Stoker there was there was a bit of an uproar because it was a self-published self work you right know, and they were like is it qualified of course, these days I don't think the Stokers have that. Well, that. Of course, I don't know that the Stokers have much. I should say. That. You shouldn't say that. But, I'll say uh, it. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> no, a lot of our friends are up for Stokers this year. I, I'm, I'm not yeah. pissing on the Stokers. But see, a lot of our friends. I I don't have a problem with Stokers. I have a problem with Stoker baking. That's what I have a huge problem with. Yeah. But I've had that with any yeah. work. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I got like tired the of the pimping too yeah. after yeah. a while. So you guys. He, he, had some success with that. Um, I mean, we did stuff for Extremes 3, in layman's terms, yes. etc. Um, then you guys land a mass market deal with uh, Penguin. Penguin. Penguin Publishing. For the Epicure. Oh, for Ashes. Or Ashes came first, you're right. Ashes yeah. was the same as Out of the Light, right. but retitled. See? This is what happens when we don't prep, Dave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, out, out. Now, did you guys revise it significantly? No. For Ashes? No? No. Um, very, very few edits that Penguin wanted. The two things that they required was change the title and come up with a pseudonym. Right. So, let's, let's look at this. 
you've been downsized in corporate America. Yeah. You kind of stumble into writing after yeah. meeting Holly. Right. Okay. You guys self publish your first book. You're doing the, the NWA thing, selling books out of the back of the trunk. Um, now, suddenly, you're at Penguin. Yeah. <laughs> What's that like for you? <laughs> overwhelming, honestly, yeah. overwhelming. Um, I did learn a great deal after Ashes was published. Um, I always thought that once someone reached that level, the checks just automatically started to come, and they <laughs> set up the promotion tours, and boy, I was, yeah, I had a lot to learn. Um, actually, the promotional tours for both Ashes and Epicure, well, you sat beside me on, at many a sign. Yep. Yep. Um, was Borders, Borders Expresses, the Walden books, Walden, yep, yep, all the little ones in the malls, that one up in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, the, no, the strip was, mall, absolutely. Yeah, that was the, that was the same one. You ever hear the Vampire Hunter story? No. So you remember Big Joe? Yeah. The, for for new listeners, Big Joe, we called him my bodyguard. What he was, he was a guy that my wife at the time, ex-wife now, used to pay to go to signings with me to keep me out of trouble. Right. That was Joe's job, was to keep me out of trouble. So that same Walden books you and I signed that, mm -hmm. doing a signing there, this guy comes up just covered in foundry dirt, just got off work. And I'm like, all right, this is my people. I, you know, <laughs> I used to have that job, except he wasn't my people, because he, he proceeds to tell me about uh, the manager of his local Walmart in Reading is a vampire, and he knows she's a vampire, and he's got a stake. He's just trying to figure out how to catch her, and he's going to stake her. And I'm thinking, all right, you know, is dude fucking with me, or is he serious? And so I, I'm trying to feel him out. And well, it turns out he's completely serious, and he wants to know if I'll help him. And no, I will not help you. And so now it becomes a like, okay, this guy is clearly unhinged. Yeah. All right. And he's getting more and more agitated. And, you know, there's a line of people behind him waiting to get their books signed, waiting to buy books. Okay. 20 minutes later, he's still standing there talking about the vampire run at Walmart. That line of people starts leaving. So now I'm seeing book sales go bye bye because of this guy. All right. Yeah. Big Joe, the bodyguard. You know what he's doing the whole time? Sitting on the mall bench out in front of that store, giggling his ass off. <laughs> didn't do anything. Didn't lift a finger to help me. The day after is when I got my concealed carry permit. Put, put okay. In. So, but yes. I, but, so, Ashes comes out. Epicure. Now, how did, they made you guys switch to a pseudonym, which yes. is, is standard in this industry. Right. Um, how did you guys decide? H.R. Halland, Holly, Ralph. Where's the Halland come from? Um... At that point, Holly had moved to Maine. Right. And um, there was a homeless gentleman who she came in contact with, I don't know how frequently, but his name was Howland. Okay. Um, and at the time, uh, my son was going to the University of Pittsburgh, and the basketball coach's name was Howland. Right. So... Now you, you bring up something interesting. Holly had moved to Maine, yes. um, and and I know we can talk about this in the air. She uh, started a relationship with the legendary Rick Hodla. Yes. Eventually, they ended up married. Right. Um, now, did Rick help you guys as far as the contract with Penguin goes, or did because I, I I knowing I, Rick, I, yeah, Rick, I love Rick Hodla. Rick never had good experiences in this business. If there was a way for a publisher to screw you, Rick went through it before any of us. Yes. So, it, how did he react to all that? I mean... I always thought it was a little peculiar how a copy of Out of the Light just happened to wind up on an editor's desk in Penguin. Yeah. You think maybe I have I have my suspicions, yeah. but I don't have anything that uh, you, you know. You think he helped you guys out there as far as well? Hey, I mean, look, that's the business. Yeah. I would have never sold the Rising if without you know, Jack Ketchum, Jack Ketchum, or Richard Lehman. Yeah. You know, uh, 
Dick Lehman were at a party at a World Heart Convention. He introduces me to the editor of Leisure, Don Daria, and yeah. says, you know, this kid's Brian, he's writing a zombie novel. Don says, oh, I'd like to see it. You know, yeah. another World Horror, uh, Don hands me a contract for, the, for that zombie novel. You know, says you might want to let your agent take a look at it. I don't have an agent. I barely can afford to buy a beer at the bar, I, let alone afford an agent. Yeah. Jack Ketchum's sitting there. Oh, here, I'll, I'll do your contract for you. And he does it. So, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. there's no shame in having people help you along the way. Right. So, you guys did Ashes. You did the Epicure. Yes. Um, then you kind of dissolved your partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Holly went on to write, but you kind of, you fell off. See, this is what fascinates me about your story. And had Dave and I been prepping, this is where I would have taken the narrative anyway. Okay. So, I, I'm satisfied with our off-the-cuff skills here, Dave. So, I mean, you're... <coughs> you, in a, in a few short years, have achieved what some people spend their entire lives trying to achieve. You, you just say, ah, I'm going to be a writer. And you do it. And then you're at Penguin. You know, mass market deal, two mass market books out, respectable anthologies, and then you just, you walk. What happened? Was it the business? Did you just, you, it, you saw how the business really rose? No, 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 it wasn't the business. Um, now, this is impromptu. If I'm putting you on the spot, no, no, so no, no it's cool. It's okay. cool. Um, I just hmm. ashes. The print run was thirty-three thousand copies. Right. We sold about twenty-seven, which for a mass market paperback, no, not good. Not good. Um, Epicure which I thought was a better book, and so did Lawrence Bender, because he was ready to produce the film. Right. Um, only sold 15,000 copies. That's it? That's it. Wow. So there was no money made beyond the advances. And then, oh, <laughs> you remember up in Wilkes-Barre, we did a signing. It was you, me, Jesus, Gary Frank. Mary San Giovanni. Mary was there. Yep. Karen Kohler, I believe. Yeah, uh, Sarah Langan. Sarah Langan, yep. Um, that was the day the review came out on Epicure. Oh, and, yes, uh, I remember that. And, Ho and Jesus walks in and said something about, did you see how they crucified your book? Yep. That was it. That, that was the, I, that was the I, point. I was done. Yeah? Yeah. See, now none of us knew that at that point. Yeah. So, so it was, it was, it was that review. I, and it was, I, that was a, that was a brutal review. It I was remember. a yeah. brutal review. I was just thinking of the Epicure. I just put together a, a non-fiction collection of introductions and afterwards and forwards I've done for other people. Okay. Believe it or not, I've got 90,000 words worth of those things. <laughs> and uh, the one, the one I wrote for the Epicure is in there. Yeah. So, so it, that was what did the review. So you walked. I did. Yeah. I did. Um, and then, what did you do while you were out there in the desert? I lived a normal life. Yeah. Now, did the urge? <coughs> strike you like would, would you have days where you're like oh I kind of feel like writing but you just you wouldn't go back to it or were you happy to leave it all behind you I was happy to leave it yeah yeah and yet you came back I did um so why you escaped <laughs> you were free <laughs> what were you no thinking? no 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 you're never free you are never free. If you have a created bone in your body, even if you think you're free, you're not. I agree. You're not. Um, it took eight years. And, uh, hi, Mary. Hello, sorry. Mary San Giovanni, entering the room. It's not ironic at all that, right, as you said, you may think you're free, but you're not. 
Mary opened the door. <laughs> wow! I just got here! I love you. You should. <laughs> all right. No, we didn't plan that. Not at all. Um, one day, I just had an idea for a zombie novel, and um, I had stopped going to writer's groups. Right. Um, with the, well, I, I kept my memberships going in HWA and International Thriller Writers, um, but the local critique group I kind of backed away from too. Right. So I went back to the critique group and I wrote the introduction to the novel, and that is where I met Stephen DeBach. Okay. Okay. Who is currently working with me? It's now a zombie trilogy. It's plotted out as a trilogy. The first book is finished in the hands of my agent. Right. Um, who is out trying to get us a contract on it, and. Um, Right now, the second book, about 20,000 words away from finishing the second. Nice. So so you're definitely back in the game. I'm back in the game. So now, you go, you go to this writer's group. Now, I'm assuming it's probably a, a lot of aspiring writers. Yes. Do they know your backstory? Yes. Do they look at you like you're insane? <laughs> they know I'm insane. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's got to be fascinating that they... they that's going to be fascinating to them. I still don't know how I freaking got here. Yeah? I don't. Well, we're glad you're back. Well, I'm glad to be back, but... <laughs> I mean, how the whole thing started, it's... It doesn't happen do, that way. Do you regret walking away the way you did? Or are you still glad you did that? Do you think it helped you refocus and realize some things? I don't have an answer to that. I don't know. You think you're going to be here for a while, right? Yeah. You guys got a hotel room? Yeah. You think about it. And <laughs> one o'clock. <laughs> you yeah, yeah. have no one else to interview. You're going to call me back. Here's up. Ralph yeah. Beaver part two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ralph Beaver, thank you for sitting down with us. Enjoy the Knob Creek. Uh, thank his you. book, Sweet Nightmares, is on sale right now on Amazon.com. That's right. A very solid little short story collection. Thank is Gravity you. Hill in that? Gravity Hill's the first story. That's in my that. favorite thing by you that you ever the, the, of everything you've written. My, and, my favorite uh, thing. And talking Hill. about bleeding onto the page, the first act of the screenplay that's in that book. Yeah, is eighty percent bleeding on the page. No, oh. so well, welcome back, Ralph, and thank you for for coming out. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, thank you man. All right. Okay, and we're back. Um. <laughs> Sorry, lost my mind there for a second. One more time, I want to thank Brian Smith's Murder Squad, a wild epic of mayhem, murder, and destruction, for sponsoring this week's show. In Murder Squad, a powerful secret organization brings together three notorious villains tasked with the mission of creating a nationwide panic by doing what they do best, killing lots of people, but on a bigger and bolder scale than ever before. The goal is distraction. The organization has things it wants to accomplish while the public isn't paying attention. Whether this goal can be achieved is uncertain, but one thing is definite. There will be blood. Lots and lots of blood. Murder Squad is available right now in paperback and for Kindle on Amazon.com. Thank you, Brian, for sponsoring this week's show. If you would like to sponsor the show, send an email to Meteor Notes. That's Meteor, like the giant rock in space. Notes, like what I'm reading from right now, meteornotes at gmail.com, and Dave will work out something with you that's in your budget. Um, I want to remind people, you know, we're over 100 episodes now, and all 100 of those episodes are free to listen to online. They're archived. People can pull them up at any time. People do pull them up at any time. Um, you know, we, we have popular episodes like Jack Ketchum 
Edward Lee, F. Paul Wilson, Tom Monteleone, John Skip and with Laura Lee Barr. You know, people are listening to those all the time. Um, so, yeah, you can advertise on next week's show. But keep in mind, the advertisement, you're not just buying ad space for next week. You're buying ad space in perpetuity, okay? Because, you know, a year from now, a new listener discovers a show, they're going through the archives, or or maybe somebody discovers Damian Angelica Walters for the first time two years from now, and, and they're just, they're fascinated with her work, and they want to learn everything about her. And, you know, they go through Google, and, oh, here's a, an interview with her from two years ago on, on this podcast, you know. They're going to hear your ad. Um, these ads exist in perpetuity. So, you know, it, it's really, really a, a good deal. It's a bargain for the prices we're charging. Um, so, yeah, email meteornotes at gmail.com and Dave will hook you up. And if there's something you want us to talk about, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or our website, the horror show with Brian Keen dot com. Uh, the Horror Show is available on iTunes, Android, Roku, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all other platforms via Project Entertainment. Visit them online at projectentertainment.com. Uh, next week, as I said, we're going to have a, a horrifying retrospective. I hope you'll tune in for that. And until then, thanks for sticking it out with me. Bye. Armcast, Dead Sexy Podcasts. I'm your host, Armand Rosamilia. Fridays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network, where I interview authors, publishers, editors, artists, filmmakers, narrators, the lady from Walmart, whoever I feel like talking to. That's every Friday, Armcast, right here on Project Entertainment Network.